Hey, everybody. I hope you are doing well still and still staying safe. I hope your family is all doing okay and you are managing all of this craziness okay. Uh, I think this is going to be our last video lecture for the semester. Uh, we'll wrap things up uh, in terms of that and then spend next week doing uh, project presentation stuff. Um, so today's uh, uh, little video will be pretty short. Uh, just some basic things to think about. Uh, in terms of uh, control room design considerations for studios and other things that I think you can just put into practice. Again, if you have a small uh, bedroom or basement project studio, some things to think about in terms of how you things, how you have things set up and how uh, you might tweak a few things and see if that improves uh, your listening environment and, and your um, transferability of your mixes into the real world and stuff like that. And so yeah, let's jump right in. First thing we're going to talk about is uh, speaker positioning and a few things having to do with speaker positionings. And so speaker output and response is altered by placement in a really important way. Like we talked about uh, with the last discussion, um, where you have your speakers um, and where you sit, I mean, is greatly affected uh, if it's in a node or an anti-node, both, again, the listener and the speaker, where uh, each one of those things placed can have a dramatic impact on what, you're, on what is being output and what you are hearing. And then something called directivity that we're going to look at in, in the next slide or two um, that has to do with the output levels uh, of particularly lower frequencies with speakers. Um, I think it's kind of common knowledge, but just a good thing to reiterate um, about good speaker positioning for, for a mixing environment is uh, ideally we're usually shooting for a 60 degree equilateral triangle. Um, anything narrower than that, we get a really narrow stereo image. Anything wider than that, we can actually have a hollow uh, stereo image or what we call that can kind of mess with a couple things we're going to talk about today can mess with what we call the phantom center image the idea of um, if you can close your eyes if you have your speakers set up and you close your eyes um, do you hear despite having the speaker set up out like this do you hear this uh, center pan information as solidly developing and being in right in front of you that idea of we hear, particularly if we're playing straight tones or, or, or really basic, simple material that, uh, again, obviously doesn't have any panning going on, that, that we have, we can picture in our mind and feel like the information is coming directly at us with having two speakers. And so um, that equilateral, 60 degree equilateral triangle helps with that, um, as well as it can be harmed if we um, don't have uh, some other things we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of the reflections coming at us. Uh, uh, tweeters at ear height. Um, again, the tweeters should be at ear height, pointed at our ears. Again, my little silly demonstration that we did in terms of doing speaker and room testing last time around was, was terrible in terms of the height. Um, but just, again, for showing purposes, uh, got us through. But uh, ideally, you want to try to get your speakers... Um, close to ear height and if not at least angled in a way so that the tweeters in particular are aimed at your ears because of how directional as we move up the frequency spectrum how the higher and higher frequencies are increasingly directional so that's important and then lastly sub placement um, some of you are working with subwoof subwoofers some aren't but subwoofers in particular can be greatly uh, uh, improved affected or diminished based on where you're placing them in your room there's a couple tricks that you can do um, obviously, you should experiment a little bit, but I, um, I, I've, if, you're, if your subwoofer is, is outputting too much at specific at um, certain frequencies, then uh, moving it away from the wall or away from the corners can help, as we're going to see in just a minute. Um, but if you're trying to get more output from your subwoofer, um, you know, one thing I've heard of people doing that, that can be beneficial is um, taking and flipping the polarity on the subwoofer output compared to your, your main speakers. And um, if you flip the polarity on the, the sub from the mains and you move that subwoofer around your room until the signal goes away as much as possible at when their, their phase is flipped or the, the polarity is switched on those between the mains or your speakers compared to your sub, um, and then you find the place in the room where those two cancel each other out as much as possible, um, then that, when you flip that polarity back around, that is where your sub is gonna have its most impact. So that's one way to, to think about that. I mean, again, depending on the sub, depending on your room, um, uh, 
it, that might be a bad thing. It, it might be a good thing. Uh, it's one thing to try though, depending on what you're working with. Okay. So here's just a quick look at what the modes look like. Those room modes that develop, and we talked about axial, uh, tangential, and oblique modes. Um, axial being the most important to think about because they're the strongest, uh, the fundamentals that develop. Um, and so you wanna be careful about not setting up in, in the mode, in the node of the mode. Um, and so some of this time, some of these we can't, or we have a hard time avoiding, but um, so here we'll look at the overhead view and we can see that the axial mode, which is the solid line that develops for the width of the room, obviously is right in the center. And we can't, we usually can't help but avoid that. We, because we want to be centered in the room. If we're not centered in the room, then it, it, that's one of those things that's going to mess with our stereo image, the phantom stereo image, the reflections we get off of each side, and we want that to be balanced. And so that's why we usually set up in the center of the room. But it's one thing to be mindful of and, and be careful of is that you're also, when you're doing that, you're in probably setting right in the center of the axial mode that develops from the width standpoint. Um, we usually, um, this is a good representation of, of where you want to be. Um, one thing I, I feel like I've heard multiple times is like if from front to back, uh, it's you kind of want to try to be almost a third of the way um, down the middle of the room. So one third, two thirds full. Something in that range is usually good um, if possible for length. Um, and then again, being mindful of height, like we talked about last time, um, this represents a 10 foot high ceiling, which is good for this guy right here. And why we, one of the reasons why we like extra height in, in studios. Um, but if we have an eight foot high ceiling, then that's when, like I talked about last time, this axial mode that develops this solid line, which is the strong one that develops is if it's an eight foot ceiling, that node is right at four feet high. And for my height, Based on the way I sit, unfortunately, that's right about right here where my ears are, um, which is why um, that 70 hertz can be problematic sometimes if you're really paying attention. Um, yeah, so uh, again, just to expound a little bit extra on what's going on, this is um, the harmonics. Here, so here we're looking at the uh, profile view. We can see the fundamental the second harmonic, which is this line right here, and the third harmonic of the profile view, which is the short dashes here. Um, and this actual halfway point is particularly problematic because of how that overlaps with the fundamental and the odd uh, order harmonic. Uh, you can see the same thing here in the overhead view. Uh, another thing that I mentioned early on was the Q factor or the directivity factor regarding speakers and, and how you set them up and where you set them up in, in uh, relationship to walls. And so uh, the direct directivity factor Q is a measure of the directional nature of a sound source. Uh, Q is defined as the ratio of intensity from the directional source, uh, I sub D divided by the intensity of an of a reference or omnidirectional source, like we talked about, omnidirectional being as if it were in free field uh, or and then sound dropping off uh, based on a function of the inverse square law. And so if we take an, a directional sound divided by omnidirectional sound, we get this directivity index factor Q uh, that you can figure out this way. The short, we're not going to do any math, but what the shorthand of the the short of what I want you to take away from all that is this is Q due to wall or corner reflections. We, we see this idea, just to go back a second, uh, of, of directivity, something that is talked about sometimes, uh, particularly we see that more in specs sometimes with or reference material for loudspeakers and, and speakers for, for live sound reinforcement and things like that. But this also just has some basic ramifications on what happens when you set up. Um, speaker. So if, if we have a speaker that we could theoretically place and hang in in free field or in space, it would have a Q of one. It would be all, all energy would be 
released, particularly low frequency wise, right, would be released hemispherically, uh, spherically, and um, and that would look like this. A Q of two it is a hemi disk, okay, and we get a gain uh, anything below about 150 hertz of about six decibels um, when we're on one single, say we place that in the middle of a room. Uh, when we place that against two walls, okay, we have a Q of four and we get a 12 decibel increase uh, frequencies below 150 hertz. And then when we place that in a three wall corner, we get a Q of eight and we get about an 18 decibel increase. And so um, that's one reason why it's particularly a bad idea if you have your studio set up, your monitor set up, and you have one speaker in a corner and one that's not, then you're getting about a six decibel boost of frequencies, say again, roughly at around 150 hertz and below an additional six decibel boost based on the directivity or the Q factor of what's happening there. One of the pair of monitors I have has, has a setting for this to take this idea into account. Um, if it has a setting for wall, sometimes it's called wall interactions or uh, it might be labeled as Q factor sometimes or something like that where mine's labeled as whole, half, and quarter. And, um, and it's a, basically it's an adjustable low cut that reduces low frequency output if it's in a corner. So if, you, if it's in a corner, um, it's at, set on one quarter setting. If it's against two walls or closer to a back wall, then it'd be on, on half. And then if it's out a little bit farther into the room, which is more ideal, um, then it's, you get put it on the full setting. If you like lots of bass, um, then you leave it on full and you push it against the wall. But just be careful because oftentimes that can lead to overemphasizing problematic frequencies that are happening. So, Okay, specular reflections. We talked about this a great deal when we talked about diffusers. And so again, review the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, um, unless it is absorbed or diffused. And we talked about this in both of these uh, lectures a great deal. Um, and then uncontrolled reflections negatively affect the stereo imaging like we've just talked about, and then the frequency content. Um, strong specular reflections can diminish our ability to perceive pitch, uh, and uh, as well as just the comb filtering, which actually this is all about, that we see as a part of strong specular reflections or like what we hear as flutter echo sometimes. Um, in terms of, so first we've got uh, without reflection treatment is this red that has super, super strong uh, comb filtering um, that you can obviously would be extremely problematic if you were trying to mix. And then with a little bit of first reflection treatment to reduce um, those strong specular reflections, uh, then that evens out and looks something a little bit more like this. So... A lot of um, trying to counteract that problem of creating that comb filtering that happens through uh, is managed through controlling initial time delay. And so this graph is a graph that you've probably seen uh, in my classes or other classes a great deal. Um, when we talk about reverb and setting up reverbs and, and things like that, we've got the direct sound, we've got the early reflections and the reverberation happens. And so. The direct sound is the sound that happens as my mouth, I speak, sound comes out of my mouth and it goes straight to you, the listener, into your ears. That is the direct sound. The early reflections are the is probably the, the first bounce that happens. Uh, and that, that would be the bounce that happens as it hits the floor and goes to you, hits the ceiling and goes to you, hits the sidewall and goes to you, maybe even one or two bounces. And that's the strong, these a little bit more spaced out early reflections. And then we've got this distance until we hit more of an even reverberation that happens as multiple bounces are happening. Boom, 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 boom. And, and all the different thousands of paths that the sound can take as it bounces around the room and then finally makes its way to your ears. What we wanna to do to try to get rid of and, and counteract those problems related with developing the comb filtering is control the early reflections and suppress the early reflections um, and increase the initial time delay. Um, and so, there's a few different ways that we can do this that we're gonna look at, but that's probably what's gonna happen because it's these early reflections that are much stronger um, that are causing those comb filtering problems most of the time.
And one way that that is done in larger studios is through uh, this idea of creating a reflection-free zone through layout design. And so um, this is a, was a pretty common studio design for a number of years, still in larger, very expensive studios can be a thing that you see sometime. And so through the plan view and the profile view, the idea is to control early reflections revive, arriving at the mixed position, um, both from a plan view that looks like this, and as you can see, based on the signal traveling out of the speakers, um, the way that the angles of the walls are laid out, it reduces all early reflections coming directly to the listener. And now usually what happens back here is we put some sort of diffuser as you saw right here, we had this um, diffractal diffuser that was diffusing low and high frequencies and, and splays them out. Um, so as they become less problematic. Um, and by the time they've traveled that long, they lose enough energy um, that they're less problematic to begin with. So we're just trying to really control those first reflections. Um, and you can see from a plan view that with this layout, we accomplish that. And then also if we look at a profile view, we do the same thing um, with a height or a a ceiling angles that look something like that. We again, pushing all the reflections to the back of the room. Uh, a lot of times we might, might have been on Nicer Studios, a large scale bass trap right here in front of the console. And so that's a very, very expensive and um, not very realistic way for us to handle them in small studios that are more common, easily, easily accessible. Um, solutions. And so that's where we see this common idea in project studios and smaller studios nowadays. And that is, again, we're still creating a reflection three reflection free zone, but we're doing it through absorbers through those first reflection points, placing a cloud um, above us in the mixed position and ideally above us and uh, large enough so that not just above our head, but importantly, um, above us enough of a distance so that the first reflection that happens from the speakers to your head is also counteracted as well. Um, one way to think about this and set this up is um, if you're sitting in your mix position and you put a mirror on a wall um, and you can see the speaker, then that is also a, a reflection angle, specular reflection angle that sound is going to have. And so one way to double check if you're going to place absorbers on your walls um, to help counteract this problem is to go steal the mirror from your bathroom or for something else and and place it against the wall and make sure that you're getting the reflection angle just right so if you're sitting in your mixed position that uh, those sidewalls have absorptive material right there to counteract that problem and ideally what have i seen something to the effect of basically to get you need to get to about a 0.8 or a 0.9 absorption coefficient that brings something down about 10 decibels as a rough estimate usually and that's enough to bring that initial time delay down to increase that width till we get to the more reverberant field to um, remove some of those problems and so again it's, it can be hard to achieve that um, 0.9 once you get into the sub uh, 1 to 2k range but the more that you do again the more that you would increase that absorption material the, the density uh, or the, the width of that absorptive material um, and its effectiveness at lower frequencies, the more that's gonna help all the way down through the spectrum. Yeah, so this is a pretty common setup design to achieve that. Uh, and um, again, if you even if you're doing this on the, the cheap and um, you're not gonna go out and make absorption panels uh, or buy some something like Oralex or something like that, even, just like from a design aesthetic standpoint, placing thick blankets or wall coverings, even some nice thick heavy curtains or something in those reflection points to cut down on those early reflections that are happening on your direct sides can be really, really, really helpful. Um, there's been some really cool studies done. Um, I haven't talked, I meant to talk about this in the diffusion chapter and I forgot, but um, that as a general rule, we 
can perceive differences better in a diffuse room, uh, an evenly diffuse room than an um, overly absorptive room uh, of the same nature, a room that's really absorptive. Um, but so there was this really interesting test that I saw done at one time and they brought in a bunch of like A-lister engineers and they had them do some testing in um, a heavily absorptive room and in a heavily diffuse room. And their, their ability to fine tune uh, and, and pick out frequency differences and, a, and boost cut differences was much better in a diffuse room than it was an overly absorptive room. Um, it's also one of the reasons, again, I didn't talk about this when we looked at Blackbird Studio C, but one of the, the philosophies behind that a, a immense room that's, that's perfectly, quote unquote, diffuse and across the entire frequency spectrum. Last thing we'll look at real quick is, again, this is a pretty common design philosophy. And in the large scale shooter, we saw that through angled walls and much more complex processes. But on, on a very basic project studio, bedroom studio standpoint, we oftentimes shoot for this idea of live end, dead end. And that's so that we can control the early reflections that happen up around and that are coming at us from the front and from us being really close to the speakers. And so we're getting mostly that direct sound from the speakers without the interactions of those early reflections degrading our uh, stereo image and our frequency perception. And then again, to so as so we're not working in an overly absorptive room that is, is dead, again, because one, because it's oftentimes easier to perceive differences in, in a more diffuse room than an absorptive room, but then also from the standpoint of enjoying being in the space and the space sounding interesting and enjoyable. Um, to go back to some things we talked about in some of the discussion board stuff is, um, I mean, there is no one right answer as to how absorptive it should be or reflective or diffuse a room should be. That depends on what you're doing. If you are a studio doing voiceover recording, then you probably want your reverb time really, really short and to be really, really dry so that you have a reverb time in the like 0.2 seconds to point to point five seconds on the high end. If you're doing music production, we want that to probably be more in the point three or four seconds to to maybe in the up into the one second mark in terms of a, a tracking room space. Uh, and if, if you do orchestral stuff, then yeah, it's probably pushed more to that one second time frame, depending on what you do. If you're in a church, obviously that has to serve dual purposes that can be problematic. If you're doing uh, a church church sound from the standpoint of the the pastor speaking at the front of the room that you want the whole back wall to be really absorptive um, and you want the room as a whole to be drier and more absorptive so you can more easily hear enunciation and it cuts down on something called critical distance and makes so that we can more easily hear consonants and again the vowel shapes and all of that stuff that allows us to hear speech and language. Um, but from the standpoint of the musicians and the band playing, you want that to be much livelier because it's, I mean, it's, it makes the music more interesting and energetic. It's why it's generally speaking more fun to play uh, drums in a stairwell versus a small carpeted room, right? Just because of all that feedback and energy that it adds and the excitement that that energy and the diffuse space adds large sounding diffuse space. And so that's always finding a balance based on what the usage is. Um, another thing that happens as we cut down on the early reflections is that we push our room, the sound of our room down and so that we can hear the sound of the space that things were recorded in more, um, if that makes sense. So again, and this is, you know, one way to do this is, you know, through purchased um, panels and diffusers and whatnot. But again, you can get really creative with this stuff in terms of hanging curtains and blankets up on this side of the wall and putting bookshelves up back here or, or just uh, stacking random things against this wall and hanging random things, hanging your guitars and whatnot on this wall. Um, any, any sort of change in elevation, change in profile is gonna help with diffusion back here. So you can get really weird and creative with what you place against this wall or hang on this wall back here. And you don't have to go out and buy panels, whereas you can, again, get creative with blankets and rugs and um, curtains and stuff like that on this side to help with that. So again, there's some ideas. Hopefully that helps. Um, I think that'll be a wrap for videos for us this semester.
and uh, we will chat soon on and discuss some board near you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.